ladies and gentlemen, we are now living in an era of creation and endless possibilities. Now, when this man became the 45th president of the most powerful country in the world, it signifies a change, a breakdown from traditions and a breakdown from institutionalization. A man with no political experience assumed the highest office in the world. We are right now in a brave new world. Back in the 1700s, when the first steam machine was made, that was the first industrial revolution. And today, we are already in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, many of us is still thinking that automation is, the, is industry 4.0. It's not. Automation is in industry 3.0. Now, the future will be built for creators, for musicians, for artists, for people who create. I represent the medical fraternity. I'm a clinician and I'm also a clinical scientist. Now, for the first time in history, we are able to choose healthcare more than sick care. Why do I say so? Is for the past 100 years, since the advent of antibiotics, you visit a doctor only when you have a problem. You do not visit the hospital of the doctor when you have no issues. That is sick care. When you're sick, we treat you. The future, with the advent of technology, for the first time in history, we are able to really practice healthcare. Therapeutic medicine has bring us all here. For better or worse, did it really solve all our problems, all your problems, all your family problems, all my problems? The answer is no. It is time, right now, with all the data and the information, that young, aspiring, impressionable university students, overseas students, the common folks, with all the information you have in hand, for the first time in history, we can talk about preventive healthcare. And even, if you're lucky, predictive healthcare. In hospital and clinics, we are taught to be reactive. So when somebody gets an, uh, a heart attack, or a brain attack, which is a stroke, we can treat. When there is no organic problem, we can treat. And when we go to the hospital or healthcare places, we are always told to take your data from blood pressure, to do your blood works, to take your BMI, or even your ECG. Now, all these are just intermittent data. What do I mean by that is that it just comes from bits and pieces. For example, if I had a heart attack an hour ago, right now, if I do an ECG, it will not be so accurate. And there are many, many instances that doctors like us, clinicians like us, miss out diagnosis because of a lack of information. What we need is a connected and concerted effort. What we need is connected data. data that comes from you when you're driving, that comes from you when you're talking to your friends, at home, during work, even sleeping. Now, why is that important? This is a graph for all the countries in Asia, the percentage of um, government funding, percentage of GDP on healthcare. Now, if we are not careful, all of us right here in this auditorium might be subject to medical bankruptcy. For the past 10 years, Malaysia has been growing at anywhere from 5 to 8% GDP, but our healthcare cost has been growing at double digits. In fact, within the last 10 years, medical bankruptcy in Malaysia has been rising exponentially. But right now, with the advent of the World Wide Web, technology and free media, patients for the first time has the right to their own medical information. And this is what I call the e-patient, or in entrepreneurship, they call it the CEO of your own health. Patient is the CEO of your own health. Now, the fifth paradigm of exponential growth, Moore's Law, talks about the steep increase in growth. Now, throughout mankind's history, from the first industrial revolution until right now, the fourth, the time it takes for change is getting shorter and shorter. And this causes disruption to be everywhere. 
Now, if medical people, medical professionals, or aspiring doctors, scientists are not careful, there will be what I call a pharmageddon, the end of all pharmaceutical industry. Why? Because right now you are empowered. You have new information, uninterrupted information from everywhere. You have the new media, which is not biased. You have your own way to source out information. Exponential growth has made things faster, better, cheaper, and smaller. Now, for those who are still using iPhone 5S, that simple piece of machine, computing power is greater than what it takes to put man, the first man, on moon, Apollo 11. What we need right now is a total reimagination. No longer imagination, no longer following a total reimagination. When those days we are reading books, hard paper, well, hard paperback books, right now we are going to Kindle, iPad, your Androids, tablets. Those days we are using hard cash, right now we are using e payment. In the past, we get all our information from the litter box in the middle of the living room. Right now you have endless streaming of entertainment programs from Netflix. And for some of you right here listening to me, you might be even watching YouTube your handphone right now. It also happens to the taxi industry. Grab is here. Now, disruption is here to stay. But in my personal opinion, disruption equal to creation. The creator and the creation is one and the same. Now for this, we look at many different ways. How do we inspire people to reimagine? And one of the things that we did is to organize a concert this year and next year, where we get people from all walks of life to come, sit, and start to feel. I myself is very um, well, honored to be given the task to set up the Frontier Medicine Institute two years ago in Malaysia to talk about Industry 4.0 and to build bridges, how healthcare can be brought to you. And we are also the first research group company to go into space medicine. Now, if Elon Musk is right, if we are really going to Mars, who is going to treat the people there? That's the basis of our inspiration. This age today and henceforth, predictive healthcare is the way to go. You must be able to predict what is going to happen, just like a tsunami warning system, so that you can get prepared of what is to come. And this is made possible by the reduction of the cost of sequencing your genome, which is your genes. 20 years ago, it cost 100 million. Right now, it's less than 2 million, oh, well, 2,000 USD. And for you to understand your own genes and your own genetic information, it allows you to know what sort of food you should take in a new area of medicine we call nutrigenomics, and even from environment. Where should you stay? What sort of food you should take? In fact, even what kind of people you should be with, if you are brave enough. We are already able to tell you your future in an evidence-based way. Now, in my personal opinion, the best drug is mobility, like what I'm doing now. Mobility doesn't mean to run your marathon. Mobility doesn't mean to go for out well, marathon and all. Mobility means to be active. And Exercise, if you are doing 30 minutes of just mobility every day, your risk for any sort of illness and disease will be reduced by at least 50%. In the next 10 years, the moment when you wake up in the morning and you look into the mirror, you are able to see how is your emotion on that day, how would the next one week be like. Anybody heard about Facebook face detection? Now, that's the beginning of all this. Face de detection is already here. And for the first time, you are able to see yourself. What, is, what do you look like 30 years from now or when you are 90 years old? And if doctors are brave enough, clinicians are brave enough, patients are willing enough and open enough, we are able to show them that if they like smoking, after smoking for 20 years, how you will look like before and after. 
This is how we treat mental disorder a hundred years ago. This is what we call convulsion therapy. We put electricity on the head and we shock, shock them, hoping to regenerate new neural pathway. But this is a hundred years ago. Right now, this is how we treat mental disease. We give you a wearable and with an app, you are able to tell your brainwave real time when are you most nervous, when do you study the best, when do you absorb the best. And this would always remind you. And we are also able to harness the same technology to treat autistic children using virtual reality. This is already being done in Mayo's Clinic in the States, and the success rate is as high as 85%. It's already here. And in our lab, we use the same thing to treat dementia. Now, at the current rate worldwide, globally, every five minutes, somebody will get Alzheimer's. And this is a huge problem because the world is aging. And we are also to, able to harness the same light therapeutics to treat teeth. And all these are FDA approved. Now, the only reason why you go to the doctor and the hospital is so that they can run some tests. Now, I myself, sitting in my clinic, there are many, many patients that come to me telling me what to do. I don't have to tell them what to do. They will tell me everything. Why do I say that? A life call is an FDA-approved ECG machine that you can use on your own. If you don't know how to read, fear not, all you need to do is to just to click the send button, you send to your cardiologist and they will interpret that to you. So nobody should have heart problem. Now, recently for Apple fans, the Apple Watch Series 4 is launched, just I think uh, middle this year. Apple Watch is the first watch, well smart watch rather, that is FDA approved to be at the same time, be able to monitor your cardiac health. And this is what we use to monitor patients with epilepsy. So all you need to do is to just carry your smartphone, it's able to detect when you are going to most likely get a seizure attack, and you can do something before it happens. Not the olden ways that you do something only after it happens. Now, for those who know a little bit about surgery, for neurosurgeons, one of the basic surgery in brain surgery is burr hole, where you just drill a hole into the skull. That would take three hours minimum. Now, University of Utah has come up with an algorithm and robotics where you can do the exact same surgery in two minutes. In Oxford, in England, where I have the chance to be uh, working with them and to take part in the research, John Rancliffe Hospital has been using robotics, robots, to treat patients with cataract and for robots to do cataract surgery with an increase of efficiency and success rate of 80%. This is in Stanford, where they have already done the miniature robot, where the robot goes into a blood vein, and you move to your heart, and as it climbs, it's able to map out your 3D heart in real time, and it's also able to treat any sort of impairment real time. Now, we are very fortunate in Malaysia that we have this Da Vinci robotic system uh, just this year and where it helps surgeons to be more intuitive and to be more precise when they are operating. A couple of years ago, Google developed a machine called Google DeepMind AlphaGo where this machine actually beat the Go chess world champion four times to one. And how this machine do is only by learning. So watching thousands and thousands of chess players, what are the decisions they make, what are the mistakes they make, and the, the machine can analyze itself. And that allows the machine to win. And in New York, they have already started to hire legal robots called Rolls. This law firm hired this robot to take over and successfully replace 24 lawyers with the same efficiency, just one robot. Now, 
My personal opinion is that we do not need to go after machines. Men and machines are made differently. Machines do not have what it makes human, humane. We need love, we need compassion, we need understanding. So what we really need in this industry 4.0 is an operating system update. This is your phone 100 years ago. This is your phone right now, today. This is your car 200 years ago. This is your, your, your car right now. What about your classrooms and auditoriums? For the past 100 years, nothing much ha have changed. So it is time we must reimagine education so that we have a chance of healthcare, not sick care. Now, we are all used to this setting. I am trained in such a setting, but the future of the hospital is this. 2016, we talk about blockchain technology. 2017, we talk about big data. This year, we talk about artificial intelligence. Next year, we are going to make machines more intuitive and more intelligent. That's called cognitive technology. Now, I believe that we should never change things by fighting what is happening. Let us have the moral courage to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. With that, I thank you.